to see. Those of us that are um, joining and wanting to uh, make sure that you tell other people to join, we are live for this whole series on um, OCA TV, mostly so that we can put everybody in the same space. We're just gonna give everybody a moment as they continue to join. Uh, as a reminder, again, you're going to want to make sure you're muted as you join and um, try to stay muted as those that are with us are presenting today as well. Uh, my name is Eleni and I will be moderating today my OCN community and this program we are continuing our series um, we hope you join us. I think we have, I believe, I'm not going to say the right number, so I'm just going to say several more. I will leave it at that. Um, thank you again for joining us and we love hearing from so many of you. We have definitely heard more faith inspirational stories than ever before. Um, I think the pandemic and the crisis, as well as everything else that is going on in the world is bringing us more together as Orthodox Christians. And we're grateful for you to be here. Uh, as a reminder, this is a live program that is being recorded so that you can share it with others. OCN is a 501c3 and we are 100% donor supported ministry. OCN's social media presence continues to grow. Um, for those of you that don't know, we've grown 20% even from last year, and we continue to have online services for you, whether you choose to watch services or join in interactive programs. Um, this program we bring to you every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Many of our audience members will be joining by phone, and we ask if you are posing a question by phone um, and you want me to ask your question or Father Chris, please say, ask my question in the sidebar. That helps us speed up the process so that we can get to all of you. We wanna thank you to our board members and volunteers, as well as all of you at my OCN community for joining us. And with that, let me turn things over to Father Chris. Thank you, Lenny. Welcome everyone to this evening's conversation to the my OCN community. It promises to be a very, I think, a very profound discussion about some issues that the face that the church needs to be facing we hope you will invite your relatives and your friends to join us. It's not too late to do that. We are very happy and uh, very proud, actually, to be broadcasting now for 25 years. This is our 25th anniversary. I can't believe it. We started back in our church of St. Demetrius in Fort Lauderdale in a little room, and we were carrying our bags with cassette tapes in it. And it has grown now to an international media outlet that reaches folks in 190 countries. Our 25th anniversary celebration continues. We have, of course, a campaign to raise funds for that. We're 70% there. We're trying to raise $150,000. And just the past couple of days, we reached 71%, I think it is. So if you'd like to join us, if you like what you're seeing and what you're hearing, and you want to support this global outreach, please go to our website, myocn.net, or you can go to the link at the sidebar that Eleni will provide for all of us. I'd like to open uh, with a prayer. And as you know, each time I have my votive candle that I light and I have my icon of our Lord and his mother. And we'll say a prayer and then we'll welcome our guests with a little bit of bio and we'll go from there. Lord, our God, whose power is beyond compare and glory is beyond understanding, whose mercy is boundless and love for us is ineffable. Look upon us and upon this gathering in your compassion. Grant to us. And to those who pray with us, your abundant mercy. Amen. Amen. So let me introduce two very special people that I have come to know and respect over the years. First is Dr. Ba Dr. Gail Walachek. She is a professor of radiation oncology, radiology, and cell and molecular biology in the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University. She is also associate dean of the Graduate Student and Postdoctoral Affairs in the Graduate School at Northwestern University. She has her DMIN, a Doctor of Ministry degree from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, where her work focused on bioethical issues. She teaches science and religion classes at Lutheran School of Theology Chicago and PTS, that is Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, of which I am a graduate also. So we're fellow alums. We also have with us Dr. Timothy Petitsis, Dr. Petitz has attained his bachelor degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, 
specializing in the concentration of science, technology, and international affairs. While there, he interned at NASA's Office of International Affairs in support of negotiations on the International Space Station. After taking his MDiv from Holy Cross School of Theology and his doctorate in Systematic Theology from Catholic University, Dr. Petitis became a member of the faculty of Holy Cross with responsibilities in the area of Christian ethics, social ethics, and bioethics. In 2020, Dr. Petitis became the interim dean of Hellenic College. Now, there's a lot more to these folks and you can find a lot more about their, them on our website. And of course, if you do a search about them. Let me bring us up to date because you remember we've done now two programs on this issue the social ethos document for the life of the church. And let me give you just that statement that we usually do. His All Holiness Ecumenical Bar Patriarch Bartholomew appointed a special commission of theologians 2017. And the commission, with the input from different provinces of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, drafted a document for submission to and approval by the Synod, which was granted by the Synod in late 2019, the document for the life of the world toward a social ethos of the Orthodox Church is now available in over a dozen languages and it can be purchased through Holy Cross Bookstore in Brookline, Massachusetts. The document was prompted in part by the Holy and Great Council of the Orthodox Church held in 2016, which endeavored to address issues of contemporary world. The Ecumenical Patriarchate understood the continued need in the spirit of the Council to further this effort. Tonight, we're going to hone in on one of those chapters, one of those sections on science, technology, and the environment. So let me go first to our guest, Dr. Gill. In this section, the church seems to celebrate the sciences and the arts, but it also cautions us regarding the integration of technology into human life. Can you sort of give us an intro from your perspective because you're one of the authors of the document, Gail? Yeah, thank you, Father Chris. I mean, look, the document for me is like very exciting because we actually have the church, you know, taking a stand that's very pro-science, um, welcoming scientific discoveries, pronouncing that they are, you know, very important for us and that this is something that we should hold up as being critical. But at the same time, the, the document is full of using our discernment, using our understanding to try to figure out whether things are appropriate or not. So for instance, um, technology issues related to cell phones. Um, use of cell phones is fine. It doesn't really say this per se, but there are many technologies that are important that save lives, but overusing them can be harmful. And so the do document you know, constantly is calling for using our own discernment rather than giving absolute pronouncements that this is good or bad. Okay. Uh, Tim, let me come over to you for a minute. And I think you know a little bit about history here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tweak you a little bit on this and say, how does the history of the hospital in Byzantium illustrate the important themes of the document regarding the spiritual use of, of science and technology? Some people might think that's a really big stretch. I, I muted myself out of uh, okay. concern, but yes, that's a that's a very good question, uh, Father Chris, and I thank you very much for being on the panel with 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 Dr. Gale and to see all of you here. It's um, in the fourth century when we believe Orthodox Christians in Asia Minor invented the concept of the hospital, and this story is is told us in a in a book called you know, The Birth of the Hospital in the Byzantine Empire by a Roman Catholic Byzantinist named Timothy Miller. And the, the church, specifically the bishops, they, they called upon the resources of science, the science of medicine, and they, they organized it in these institutions to, to heal the world. And this is what the document talks about, this holy use of science in the context of a fallen world to ease suffering and to restore things in a godly way. And uh, these bishops, they knew that science, uh, the science of, of medicine in Greece was bound up with pagan practices, the cult of uh, Asclepius and other gods of healing. And, and yet they, they took 
uh, those doctors and without asking them to specifically you know, change their religion, they deployed them in this new way and they taught them a higher way and they, they captured medical science for the church. And, you know, that's, that's a legacy that we, you know, have to, have to emulate. And I, I think too, that it's important for us to state that the church is in the so-called business, if you will, I hate using that term, but I will just for tonight's purposes of restoration and transformation that the church is not here just to be a stagnant entity that sits and just takes from people and takes from people. It's there to imbue them with the Holy Spirit so that they can be transformed and changed. I believe that's where you were, you're headed there with your statement. Is that correct, Tim? That's correct. It's a, it's a transfiguration of the world and, and, you know, the use of this rationality that God gave us as part of being in the image and, and according to the likeness of God, that we're reason, you know, reason endowed creatures to, you know, to do things in a better way. Okay. Now, when we go, Gil, just for a second, I want to come to you because I know in, in some times of our history, uh, religion and science, and maybe even today, religion and science seem to be not necessarily working together. They don't, their hands don't come together. They kind of lock and push on each other. And part of that is probably a very good thing. But talk to us about environment. Uh, I mean, people are going to ask questions about vaccinations. That's a big, big issue. We have six children. I know that was always a big discussion. Do you vaccinate? Don't you vaccinate? What do you give them? What don't you give them? And now with the coronavirus, we're hearing that there will be a vaccine sometime next year. So here's the question for you, Gil. In places, the, the social ethos appears to defend science from criticism. Is this really the case? And if so, is, is it appropriate? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right, Father Chris, in that there is a lot of there's a lot of perceived tension between science and religion. And I think the document didn't explicitly state that, but what it was sort of trying to do was stand up for the importance of science as well. We we all believe that theology is important, but also trying to say, but science has a lot to offer us, and that too is very important. And we didn't we didn't explicitly deal with COVID. In fact, this was written before COVID became a problem. Um, and, and to tell you the truth, the commission that wrote it actually discussed the question of, do we release it now? Or do we think about putting something in related to COVID? Mm -hmm. um, and what we decided was that there are actually very few problems that we call out specifically. It's not terribly prescriptive. It doesn't say, do this, don't do that. And, but that there are parts to it that do speak to issues of COVID, caring for others, caring for those who are in uh, bad situations, as Tim just said, kind of serving as a hospital um, in, in, in both the physical sense and the spiritual sense. So that comes through, I think, a lot in the document, but there was nothing specific named about that. Um, in terms of vaccines, again, it was not specifically called out, but in that idea of it, having a public health awareness, it certainly came out in that sort of sense. Let me ask you this, Gil. I know that it's been talked about, and I'm not looking to place blame here, anyone, or, or pick on anyone, but the issue of a pandemic of this nature, uh, and you from a scientific point of view can probably tell us if you know, uh, this was something that some people did predict would happen or they saw it on the horizon. They didn't think it would have this huge effect that it's had worldwide. But was there an indication that something like this could happen like it did with the Spanish flu in the yeah. early 1900s? So I quote this paper to everybody, I actually read a line right out of it from 2003, where a scientist said um, that we are going to have a problem with the amount that bats are impacting our culture sooner or later. And the fact that exotic animals are eaten in China, we will probably have a, a pandemic that is way beyond what we can expect. And COVID the coronavirus category was actually called out specifically in 2003. So this was predicted in the scientific community for a long time. So the fact that people knew something or even you know, intelligence services or health services had some idea, but they just didn't have the uh, probably the wherewithal at that point to predict this massive thing that's going on. And we know that we're dating this program by stating this, but that in Europe, we know that they're headed now uh, for a second lockdown there. So we're praying that that will pass soon. There's just on millions Tuesday. of people affected. Yeah, second lockdown began on Tuesday in Austria and begins in Greece tomorrow, actually. My gosh, okay. 
Okay, uh, Tim, Chris, can yeah, I add something to this issue of, of the pandemic? There's a, a very nice book, easy to read, uh, by Rodney Stark, S-T-A-R-K, called The Rise of Christianity. And he has an entire chapter on how the early church in the first three centuries dealt with pandemics. There was a, uh, a terrible pandemic in 165 AD and another in 250 AD. And the estimates are that maybe as many as a quarter of the, of the Roman Empire's population was carried off in each. Um, so the church has, has faced these things before um, with love and with calmness and with taking the risk to, to treat the sick, you know, at our own, at the risk of our own, you know, lives. I, I see many of the uh, first responders, some of them that I know, uh, doctors and nurses, but I would also call the priests uh, and the lay people, the deacons that go into the hospitals as first responders. Uh, I've been a priest now for four decades, and I know I've gone into many, many hospitals. Thank God I've never come down with any disease or contracted anything. But our priests are on the front line. Our clerical people are on the front line visiting the hospitals uh, daily, visiting hospice, uh, visiting um, adult homes. So it's been quite a challenge, quite a challenge. And I like, we've, we coined the phrase months ago when the pandemic began, when we began this community, my Ocean community, our, our uh, statement was it's faith over fear, that knowledge will give you power to be able to deal with it. And many times faith, part of faith is the knowledge of what do we believe? That's why the social ethos for the life of the world document, in my opinion, is so important because as Dr. Gill said in the beginning, we're actually talking about these things. We're beginning to unpack them. So Tim, let me come back to you for a second. Um, according to the document, how do we distinguish between these merely technical fixes to the world's problems versus responses that involve a genuine repentance and what I think we can call a spiritual renewal. Yes, that's a, that's a good question. And I think the document does that well, because maybe in outside the church for a lot of people, science is their religion, or it is the, um, it, it is their, so they look to it for their salvation. Mm -hmm. um, and they have hope uh, always around the corner, there's some technical fix for our problems. And the document says, you know, that the, the goodness of the world and the goodness of the human person is much deeper than that. And that a more, a more wide ranging repentance uh, is needed as we confront issues, um, a reordering of our desires and asceticism, the transfiguration that we start to think of ourselves as the priests of creation, as the ones who are responsible to make sacrifices for the life of the world. And, you know, you can see that that kind of thing um, right now, even in this, uh, the pandemic issue that, you know, that question of what sort of risks are we called to take for the salvation of others? You see many people in a spiritual way volunteering for vaccine trials. And, and I think we should be happy when our children, our grandchildren pursue these scientific careers with the, the kind of ascetic rigor of dedicating themselves to these hard subjects for what they might bring for human healing. That's a very good point, very good point. And I know that the document, and uh, Dr. Gill, since you are part of the, um, uh, the commission, you wrote this, uh, I would ask you to, to look at this point, which I know Father John Chrysavis, who was the coordinating this, thine own of thine own we offer to you from the divine liturgy when we offer the bread and the wine to become the body and blood of Christ. Uh, we're actually offering ourselves and everything around us. So this document's called for the life of the world, not for the life of me. So we're seeing as, as Dr. Tibbs says, we're talking about reaching out greater than ourselves. That is so, so important. So let me go to you, Dr. Gill for a second and say, how do you think the document can be used by the church for this greater conversation of, of the world rather than the self? Yeah, so I think that there are many ways um, it can actually be used. Um, first of all, it, you know, there are many kind of prescriptive statements that are made out there. You can find, you know, you should not do this or you should not do that in many places. I think that this document, instead of trying to provide 
it, it, it actually tries to provide a guide for how to think through these issues. So when you deal with it from kind of an orthodox world global way, it's more about how we as orthodox think through things. And, it, and I tell you, it wasn't just written for orthodox, it was actually written for the world. So it's for the life of the world, but it's also written for the world to tell others this very same message. So I think it, it's true that we wrote it with an orthodox audience, at least in part in mind. We also wrote it for everybody to read it. And there have been commentaries that have come not just from Orthodox, but, but from elsewhere, many others have welcomed it. I mean, I have colleagues in the Lutheran church, for instance, I teach at a Lutheran seminary, and they're actually using it for a class um, mm -hmm. because it gives perspectives, Orthodox perspectives, which are in a way different often than, than the, the approach that they use to come to answers to questions. And is this the first time in, in your knowledge, both of your knowledge, that um, that this has been done by the Orthodox Church? We don't, we don't normally jump into these areas, do we? Well, there are a number. I mean, I, I don't want to name names, okay? But there are certainly some statements out mm -hmm. there that are, that to tell you the truth, are actually kind of scary, okay? Um, a lot of times they have, make, they make statements about scientific principles and how you shouldn't practice this or you shouldn't practice that, and they're based on faulty science, from the beginning, we made up our mind, minds that this was not going to be based on anything that was faulty. We were going to make, we were going to, you know, hone it carefully to make sure it was highly accurate. And, you know, at least, you know, as a scientist, I can tell you, we, we were very careful in how we wrote things. Um, and it took time. It took time to produce yeah. the document. It wasn't just a sit down, and, write it, and that's it, it right? Team effort. I mean, frankly, you know, I, I, I hesitate to even call myself an author of this because, it, at the end, it was such a team effort that it was everybody working together and it was everybody's ideas coming together, That's which great. was very beautiful. And we're grateful to you and, and to the entire group of people that wrote this and those who have now agreed to come on, like Dr. Tim, to join us too. Uh, Eleni, let's uh, go to those who are watching to see if we have any questions there, uh, either from social media or from the Zoom call itself. Do you have anything? I can go on yeah. with our guests, but let's see. Sure, one question that came up, and, and I'll leave it to you all who wants to address it, but um, what's a specific example of how we can relate to the so-called document in today's world? Like what's an actual tangible example that we should look at? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take, to take that. I mean, so from a tangible perspective, I think the most important message you can get is that you need to pray think and discern through mm. any question that's bothering you. That's the most tangible message. So, you know, everybody wants to have like, you know, a commandment that tells them do this, don't do that. This says you have to pray and use discernment and, and really give your heart into trying to solve issues, not just, you know, read what's in a textbook somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's the most important message. So that means you cannot live in the, excuse me, if anyone works for Google, but you can't work, live in the Google world where it says read more. You've got to read more. You've got to press the button and you've got to go. There, and then you have to work with your spiritual father. We have to pray. I think people are telling me, I know they're praying more now than they ever prayed before. I said, well, how is that possible? You don't you ever gone to church. He said, father, we don't only pray in church. We pray at home. We pray when we walk. So that's important. It's praying. You said it, praying. Thinking and discerning, those three. I think that's sort of the refrigerator moment from this evening's conversation. Other questions, Elaine? <clears throat> but Chris, can I just jump in on this question of Please whether this, this has been attempted before? Certainly um, on specific issues in bioethics and other things, the Church of Greece has a, the, the Synod of the Bishops has a subcommittee for bioethics. The very famous Metropolitan Nicholas Hadzi Nicolaou has authored or guided many of those documents. Other, other synods across the Orthodox world, um, some churches have prepared whole documents, you know, sort of compendia, but many address specific issues. And then I, I would say with some pride, I mean, in a healthy sense, that for decades, that one of the functions of the clergy laity congresses of the uh, Greek Orthodox Archdiocese has been subcommittees that 
that will prepare statements on these kinds of issues. And they may not get wide circulation, but it's an opportunity for uh, you know, a group of clergy together with theologians to think through things and, and to wrestle. So our church has not been you know, absent. And, and to go back to that example of St. Basil in the fourth century, we invented the hospital. We, you know, we invented the orphanage. We, we made these efforts and thought things through and that has to be our model that we have to engage and get, a, get, a, get ahead of the curve a little bit. We shouldn't only be so reactive. Yeah, right. and let me just jump in, Jim. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, there are a lot of groups that have been engaged in dialogue for a long time. I mean, um, I'll put in a plug, but Oak Camper begins their meeting tomorrow. Yes. It's a virtual meeting, so anybody is welcome to attend it. <clears throat> it's the Oak Camper website. Just do a search on OCAMPR and you'll find out about it. They've been engaging with in this issue for a long time. I don't know how many of these documents, though, have you know, been, been blessed by bishops and that make, makes them be slightly different. I think you're right about Hadzi Nicolau, Metropolitan Hadzi Nicolau. He, his, he has put a great deal of effort and I've actually interacted with him. He's done some amazing work. Again, I will say most of what he's done is very specific, um, not as broad ranging as this, uh, this social ethos is, but still, you know, a really good step toward um, that sort of discussion and dialogue. Very good, very good. Eleni? Uh, any others? Sure. sure. So we did have a question um, uh, specifically from the document. So I don't, I don't know uh, how much you want to drill into it, but um, more so, I guess there was a specific line that in our age of the ecological crisis, um, we draw on all the research of the scientific research and theory to seek out an even deepen uh, knowledge of the world and ever effective solutions of our shared dangers. What does that mean? Hmm. Gail, you want to jump on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so there's a big section of this document that is <clears throat> devoted to the environmental issues of today. And, um, you know, at, at being a commission of the ecumenical patriarch, I don't think one can uh, even question that we're going we're gonna to take a very strong stand on environmental issues because he's taken a strong stand. Um, I think in that, that sort of statement, but I don't, I, I don't remember, I mean, I, I can't remember, is it written somewhere so I can actually read or Eleni, can you read it one more time what the statement itself is? Sure, it was in, it was in, it looks like uh, part eight, science, technology, and the natural world. Yeah, I, I, I have the document up in front of me, but I don't, I don't know what, could you read it's it? It's under 71. Sure, I'll read it again. Um, let's see. Let me go back. Uh, Christians should rejoice in the advances of all sciences, gladly learn from them and promote specific scientific education as well as public and private funding for legitimate and necessary scientific research. Yeah, I don't know if that's the first the same one you read before, but I think um, no. what, what this uh, what this statement is saying is that um, we, we do need it. I mean, the church has taught for a very long time. I mean, in fact, even in ancient Judaism, you can find that there was a, a reverence for knowledge and that all knowledge came from God and that um, scientific knowledge also comes from God. And it's a blessing that, like, for instance, let's use our current COVID problem. The amount of scientific effort that's been going into trying to solve this problem is incredible. Without that knowledge, we wouldn't, there, we wouldn't know a lot and we wouldn't be at least some steps on to developing a vaccine. Um, this is an amazingly short time for the amount of knowledge that we've gained. That's because of funding, that's because of private foundations that give funding. That's the kind of scientific knowledge that is, you know, it actually saves lives. It will save lives in the end. And that's, I think, the, you know, kind of the basis of that kind of, of that statement. Okay, Eleni, did you find the, the first quote that was given? I apologize, yes, I read the wrong quote. So I'll reread it just to read clarify. It. Please. Yes. Um, in our age of ecological crisis, especially, we must draw on all the resources of the scientific research and theory to seek out an even deeper knowledge of the world and ever more effective solutions to our shared dangers. Yep, I even found the um, exact statement. So I, th I think, again, what we're doing is we're calling upon knowledge here to help, uh, help guide us to understand what's happening, um, what's the cause of what we're doing, how can we understand it better, um, and then at the same time, to try to use knowledge as best we can to change people's behaviors, to cause, um, uh, you know, um, not, not just discernment, but also repentance. 
Um, and in fact, the ecumenical patriarch himself has called for repentance. So, um, you know, looking to alleviate the suffering everywhere is included in this. And, and there is a lot of human suffering. I don't think in the U.S. we notice it as much, but in other countries, particularly in poor countries or in Alaska, for instance, um, the results of global climate change are pretty horrific. I mean, there are whole villages in Alaska that have been wiped out. Um, that don't exist anymore. People have lost their homes. They've lost their livelihoods. Um, we have huge amounts of flooding that goes on. You know, how, how much, how, we have hurricanes that hit our Southern coast and there's more creeping up of water that where there's, the, the land is just not there. And ice caps are melting in large part because of global climate change. So we're asking, we're here saying that we can explain it better from science and that maybe by understanding it better, we can help to alleviate those, the, the pain of those who are suffering from it as well. And okay. then, you know, also hoping that we'll develop new technologies that can be helpful for this. Mm -hmm. And the issue too is, is a sincere dialogue. I think Gail and Tim, you'd agree with me that uh, it's tough today to have a dialogue with someone where you actually sit down and you talk from a position of knowledge and strength and caring and it doesn't devolve into uh, talking points from a various political party. That's a very dangerous thing today. The only thing that I know that's remained solid for over 2000 years is the word of God, is Christ, as St. Paul says in, in Hebrews, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So if we don't create an environment in which we can sit and talk and learn about issues, all we're gonna do is just shoot past each other. And we're not gonna we're not gonna transform the world, that's for sure. And if the our goal is go ahead. place to do that, I don't know where it is. Yeah. You know, F Father Chris, I just want to say, I mean, I think the document is not it's not a, a naive um, promotion of science. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly it's science and technology gave us the internal combustion engine and global warming. So to think that always there's gonna be some further technical fix. Nevertheless, this is a fallen world. And many times the best we can do is, you know, solve the problem before us and know that the next generation is going to have to solve their problems that may even result from our solutions that we don't just like when we, you know, we, we ended infant mortality so, somehow I, I, now we're terrified of overpopulation. So but, but this is the consequence of living in a fallen world and science has a role to play to mitigate those effects. But I, I wanted to give a personal example about the environment, if I could. Sure. My dad was a research chemist. He's retired now for 38 years at Goodyear Tire. And uh, I remember reading a newspaper article once and someone was uh, complaining about the high cost of environmental regulations. And I said to my dad, you know, what do you think about that? And he said, well, you know, my experience at Goodyear was, you know, the government regulation would say, you know, minimize or eliminate the use of such and such a, a you know, a deadly chemical. And many times we had to rethink the, the, the process of, you know, manufacturing. Many times the result was cheaper and we didn't have to use a, a, a deadly chemical and pay those medical costs. And storing that stuff or, you know, transporting it was a danger and liability insurance. And so something outside of science, faith and politics and the human process using science as well has to set the guidelines in the direction. And, uh, and when we do so, then there's the hope that humbly and relying on God will come towards some kind of a, of a solution, but we're never going to create utopia through science document is not is not saying that at all and i hope i didn't give that impression no no and tim thanks for clarifying i mean the document's actually about balance okay it's right. trying to say we need to balance things we need to balance there's good here but there's bad here too we need to try to maintain that balance and we use our discernment and our conscience in a way to try to understand those things and achieve that balance so i think you're exactly right and that's that's the clear uh, the clear goal of this thing. There's no doubt about it. Part of what we do at, at OCN is orthodox advocacy. It's an ability to share the truth as we understand it with the world. And we take sort of these gatherings, if you will, to give adults and children an opportunity to sort of crack the clamshell open and and look at the pearl that's within or the oyster shell that's within. 
Uh, many times we just look at it closed, though it looks great. Yeah, and we just pass it on to the next person. We're saying it's time to crack these things open, open the treasure chest of what Orthodox Christianity has and share it with the world, which we, I feel, have not done a good job with. We need to start speaking out, not in a Lord over you fashion, but sharing the truth that we know. Tim, I want to come to you now about another topic, which I hope you can address, and that's artificial intelligence. That seems to be something new. I know now if I, I take my phone and I actually will text something on the phone, it's finishing my sentences for me. It's almost frightening. So what do you see as the greatest threat that's posed by this so-called artificial intelligence? And how might we avoid the perils or should we just let it go? Wow, that's a, that's, it's a, that's a very tough issue. And we know that there are kind of gradations of access, let's say. I mean, AI is not something that uh, most of us think about a lot, artificial intelligence. Whereas, you know, some small group of people um, are pushing the boundaries of machine learning to such an extent that, uh, that beyond levels that we can maybe even imagine, and some of the people involved in this search are sounding the alarm. So it's not me or just some science fiction writer or something, but scientists in the area are saying, we have to uh, be cognizant of the fact that machine learning may make machines or software that is you know, terrifyingly smart, that we can't even understand what they're doing. Um, and that would, from our perspective, have kind of a mind of its own, and we wouldn't know exactly how to, you know, let's say stop it. So this is, this is, you know, one aspect of science in a fallen world is that, you know, there is that sorcerer's apprentice aspect of things like in, you know, the, the Disney film. And I guess that has an older lineage, but that, that, you know, we can start to create technologies that, you know, get away from us. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and the most vocal proponent of you know, some kind of preparation is the, the famous entrepreneur, Elon Musk. And he has started a company. He's trying to meld the human mind with, with AI. And, and what, what a world that would be. I mean, it's, it's impossible for me to imagine right. what that would be like. And it's certainly something to pray about. And we shouldn't um, just be so just so confident that scientific development is always for the good. You know, we've, we have, uh, we had a situation recently in the last five, 10 years in Canada where they moved to outlaw the divulging of the gender of a child while still in the womb, because in some countries and they're immigrating to Canada too, of course, welcomely, but the practice of sex selective abortion where if the child is a girl, you don't want it. It's so destructive. Well, that science technology gave us that power mm -hmm. to do that. And, but as Christians, you know, we think that's a terrible thing. Well, in AI, this is a whole nother aspect of something that we're gonna be able to do, or we're gonna create that could, you know, get off the leash and might not exactly have the impacts we want. That's, <laughs> that's a very dangerous part. Gail, you wanna to respond to? My lab actually does AI. We do, we do machine learning anyway. Okay. We do it to try to understand um, cancer better. And we use it to try to identify patterns in cells. Um, so so it, it's, it's very useful technology. The, the document actually does call out AI, at least in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks that, and it says that we must be vigilant and watch what it's going to be used for and be careful. But at the same time, it may marshal in some new capabilities that are important to us. So again, it, even for AI, it's that balance all the time that, that's, that's important. Um, the other new uh, technology that's mentioned in there is, is uh, gene editing, which again, same yeah. idea. Yeah, it seems to me that um, we really want answers to things. We do not want to struggle through the issues that Tim, I think, or Gail, you said at the beginning about prayer. And let me pick it up. Prayer, thinking, and discerning. Gail, you said that. So prayer, thinking, and discerning for us is, yeah, it's nice. You know, let somebody else do that. I just want to have the answers. Give me the answer. I don't have time for this. I keep moving. I remember my years, and this goes back to, to Tim up at Holy Cross, I'm a graduate of Hellenic and Holy Cross, and I remember being 
in the library then with Dean Timothy Andrews, one of the, the first mm. priests who was the librarian there. And I remember going through the card, the card catalog. I remember sitting down and getting tons and tons of books and carrying those books to the dorm. And then Dean Timothy Andrews coming after me, why didn't you return those books, okay? Well, now we have all those books on a computer, maybe not all. So things have changed drastically in the ability of the average person to garner knowledge. The problem is what filter are we using when we take that knowledge and put it within ourselves so we can live for the life of the world. That to me is, is a frightening thing. I mean, we use a Smith Corona typewriter and, and white out and now using a delete, a computer and it's gone in a second. Uh, things have changed drastically. Not necessarily bad, not necessarily bad, but they've changed to the point where we have to think, discern and pray, at least in my opinion. Do you guys have any response to that? I, I would like to jump in on that first to say that, you know, the more, the more we can do in terms of science and technology, the more we will want our young people to also be very steeped in the humanities and religion and philosophy and history and theology, because they have to, to keep the balance, you know, that, that Gail mentioned, you're going to have to develop that non-technical side to an equal degree and really think about the great literature and the great works of art in the world. And it's very concerning that universities especially, but also every level of education, the arts will get pushed aside because we think we've got to have the technical training so our kids will get jobs. But if we're going to preserve a human future and a godly future to keep that balance as science and technology develop, we have to cultivate the human arts. Okay. Well, I, want to, I want to also agree with that and say that it's, that's also recognized a lot by scientists. So what happened was when um, Bush established his committee, President Bush, on gene cloning, um, he brought in several people and gave them homework to do. And the guy who was in charge of the committee, he was a, a scholar at University of Chicago, he actually gave everybody about 20 fiction books to read because he said, how can we talk about cloning and all these other things if we don't have a feel for humanity? And we gain human our understanding for, for, about humanity by understanding human stories. And, um, and I always thought that was, that's, that's the way to go. That's the way to begin things. I think the future of, the, of education is something like, a, a, you know, a big emphasis on the theological humanities to, to put, to coin a phrase, to, to really study the whole, you know, gamut of human experience through the lens of our faith and what we know from our saints and our mothers and fathers of the church. And I'm afraid, Tim, that we've lost the ability to see that because we want the quick answer. As you said before, we want the students to be able to be gainfully employed when they're done. So we don't have the time for that. Uh, that to me is spells disaster for the future as far as I'm concerned. That's my own um, sort of thinking, if you will. Eleni, let's go to uh, questions, more questions from our viewers this evening. Um, sure, I, I thought this might come up tonight. So someone asked, um, can you say anything in relation to, if, if you've watched it, the social dilemma and how it relates to orthodoxy based on this dilemma? I haven't seen it, so I can't comment, but maybe maybe Tim can. This is a documentary, The Social Dilemma? Is that what yes, it is? I, I, I believe. I'm sorry, I haven't seen it yet. Put it on my list. Okay. okay <laughs> add it to your list. It's a private question, so I won't call the person out. I did see it, but I can't comment on it. <laughs> I've written it down, and I'll have to see it. <laughs> Others? Um, I'll ask your question for you, Anita. Is that okay? Okay. Um, she says, I'm concerned by the term fallen worlds. What exactly does that mean? Tim, do you want to take it or you want me to? I th I let's, let's both give it a go yeah. because it's, yeah. it's big, it's big it enough. I, I think it, it's, there's some sense in the Christian tradition that when God created the world, his intention was not for us to, to suffer in the way that we do or to hurt each other in the way that we do, that we find ourselves somehow in situations of, of illness, of poverty, of want, that are not exactly within God's design. And, you know, the story from the Bible is that this is related to the transgression of Adam and Eve. 
Um, of course, the story in our own lives is our own mistakes and sins and transgressions tend to, you know, we, we, we throw away opportunities, we hurt people we shouldn't, we, uh, you know, so many things are going on. Um, I think one way to put that, though, in the light of Christ is for things to get better, we have to renounce hubris. And the document at the beginning of this section really, you know, let's, we, we civilization takes a miracle. It takes hard work plus a miracle from God. And we can't, we can't forget that. The secular world thinks on its own. But no, we always need, Napoleon said very famously, if I have to choose between a good general and a lucky general, give me the lucky general every time. And th there's a lot of wisdom in that, that, you know, that life is so complicated. We need God's help in prayer if we're going to negotiate these, these shoals. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add, I mean, at least from the document perspective, I can say that, you know, that exactly what Tim brought up is what, what we had had in mind. I mean, you know, the world is, is not perfect. I mean, you know, there are there's corruption in governments, there's corruption in in people, families have problems and difficulties. The world is not perfect. And so that's what we mean by a fallen world is that we live in a less than perfect world, but our aim is actually for perfection. And I, and I want to take off from what both of you said, and I was reading the document and reading some of your comments that you gave me before, the deep training in gratitude is needed. A culture of gratitude rather than a culture of consumption or self-advancement. None of us exists in isolation from the whole of humanity or fear the totality of creation. So those issues are very important that we take a step back as we're thinking about this document for the life, again, not of me and of you, but of the world, we start thinking about the greater good, the greater fact that although things can be very difficult and we'll just take, if you want, the, the over 100,000 people that have died in America, and we can say that has been hell for these people and for their families sitting there and talking through glass or on an iPhone saying goodbye for the last time, okay? but we have to move forward. We have to go on. That doesn't mitigate what people are going through, but it states to us that we have to create a much stronger feeling of gratitude within ourselves and for the people. I mean, tonight you're 45 people just on Zoom. I don't know how many thousands are watching all over the world. That myocene community coming together and talking about a document like this, in my estimation, is extremely important. Uh, Eleni, we have one. We have one more question. We have time for one more question, and then I have one final question that I'd like to ask Gail. I need to unmute myself. Okay. Uh, Ethan just has a statement: "Sit, talk, learn." Almost sounds quaint in a contemporary America. Yeah. I don't know. With as much as we are uh, locked up these days, with more, more, more t locking up coming, coming to pass. I mean, this is a time for quiet. I mean, you know, everybody can look at COVID and it, it is a pandemic. It is a horrible thing, but there are some good things that come from it too. I mean, you know, all those times when you said, I don't have time to meditate, you do now. All those times when you said, I don't have time for a good prayer life, you do now. So, so there's, there's no reason anymore that, oh, I'm too busy. Oh, I've got all these things in my life. You actually have the chance to take time to do those things. This is the time to do it. And maybe those habits you build up now will last you through when we open back up fully. Okay. And, and I think, you know, to sit, talk and learn, and, you know, part of that is to love your enemies. And I know we're in a very difficult situation in this country, but right now, if you can pray for the other side that you're afraid of and really cultivate love in your heart, that is actual spiritual work that will get you further and give you more wisdom and more patience because, you know, this too shall pass, but this is a golden opportunity for us to grow spiritually by praying for whatever it is, wh whomever it is we fear, and, and starting to cultivate real love for them. And I know, too, that many families right now are reeling at their breaking point, uh, financially, uh, emotionally, socially. Uh, they have their children at home. They're, the parents are now working at home, and they're teaching at home. Uh, it's almost a, an impossible situation for many, many families. So it's important that we have community, that we have people that we can reach out to, uh, to guide us, to heal us, to hold us even. 
and to say, you know, it, it will pass, it will pass. Uh, but I, I fear those who are not able to reach out. And, and I hope that if anything else, that uh, the Miocene community and what we offer, uh, offers people sort of that avenue, not the only one, but one of the avenues people could go down to come closer to Christ. Uh, Gail, I have one final question for you, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, the document was written to the worldwide pandemic, <coughs> excuse me, prior to the pandemic. We touched this a little bit, but I'd like to go a little bit deeper. What can we infer about how to handle COVID in the light of the document? Because that's really the burning issue today, aside from politics and you know, elections. <laughs> this, this, the social ethos document, is that what yes. you're asking? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, you know, I think what we have to learn from it is that we need to care for each other. And you can think about how we care for each other, but the science tells us that wearing masks is a way not only of caring for yourself, but actually caring for others. In fact, you protect others by wearing a mask much more than you yourself are protected. And while it feels cumbersome and horrible, that's one way that you can show love to everybody is to wear a mask. You know, when, whenever you're around people, you can wash your hands. I mean, wa washing your hands is, has, is a very symbolic thing in a way. It, you're trying to cleanse yourself, but, but to do that now in order to help save lives, that, there's a beauty in that, I think. Um, so so the, all those things that we've learned from our, you know, from our science, I think that we, we, we need to apply them, but out of love, not because somebody gave us some rule that we have to follow. Um, so I, I, I think, and I think that's clearly in the spirit of the document too. Well, I have to tell you, I've, I've washed my hands more than I've ever done before. And I actually learned how to do it because I watched, what was it? One day I was watching uh, CNN and they had Dr. Sanjay Gupta on and he actually showed how a surgeon washes his hands. You have to wash the top, you have to wash the thumbs, you have to wash in between. I said, oh my gosh, this is complicated. Well, but that's why it I, takes more than 20 seconds. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that's important. All right, Lenny, anything else? Let's go to our, um, let's go to some of our reminders that we have for upcoming programming. Sure. Um, let's see, what do we have coming up? Um, well, our, our first e-meeting we will be having with um, Father, actually Holy Mount Athos, Elder Frem with Fatopedi. That's something that, that already happened and we have that scheduled and is there to share with other people. We wanted to make sure that we had that. Um, Father Chris, do you wanna share next week's? Sure, uh, next week we have Paulette Poulos and uh, RJ and Agiros, who are going to be on. They're the leaders of Leadership 100. Uh, Leadership 100 was one of the first um, uh, corporate, uh, what could you say it, uh, gifts that came to Come Receive the Light. Then it was the first beginning of a national radio program in Greek and in English. And they were the first people that believed in Come Receive the Light, now OCN. So we're gonna feature them and the wonderful work they're doing. Uh, Father Michael Marcandoni will continue his Real Deal program. That's Wednesday evenings. Uh, Sunday, right after church, we have Father Demetrius Lee from the cathedral in Washington, D.C., St. Sophia, where he reflects literally from either his backyard or his car as he's driving home. I hope he's a little careful with that, uh, about the Sunday's gospel. And uh, the next social ethos document discussion, you can go to our website and you can find more information. Every other week, every week, we'll be covering a different chapter of this. And I want to thank our special guests uh, this evening, Gail and Tim, for being on with us. And again, beginning the conversation. Uh, Eleni mentioned uh, Elder Ephraim, Yero de Ephraim from Vatopedi. Uh, we have a, the first E sort of meeting with him. Uh, that will happen in December. He's done several of them now with the students of St. Ticons. That was done, and it's on our website. Tomorrow he does one with chanters around the world. And then he does one with the Romanian church and that's gonna have two to 300,000 people on it. So we're very excited about partnering with Pemtusia, which is what we do. We do have a new quarterly magazine. We're actually preparing that and editing it. It's not gonna be mailed out. It's gonna be in a digital format and uh, you'll receive copies of that. So it's for faithful uh, seekers, if you will, and the deeper thinkers. So let me close uh, with a prayer tonight. And first of all, in thanksgiving to God uh, for all of you. Lord, bless those who praise you and sanctify those who put their trust in you. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Protect the whole world. 
protect the body of your church, sanctify those who love the beauty of your house, glorify them in return by your divine power, and do not forsake us who set our hope in you. Grant peace to your world, to your churches, to those in public service, to the armed forces, and to all of your people. For every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from you, the Father of lights. To you we give glory, thanksgiving, and worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please remember to support the 25th anniversary of this entity. It's very important. We can't do it without you. Thank you again to our very special guests this evening, Gail and Tim. Please stay safe and keep the faith alive in you and in your home. Remember to always have faith in what you listen to and what you watch. Please support myocn.net, which is the wind in the wings of the angels carrying the message of Christ to the world. And yes, as we say every week, don't forget to wear your mask. <laughs> Good night, everyone, and God bless you. Good night. Good night.